Namaste, everyone. This is Pratista Strong, Dr. Strong here from Gotham New Clinic. And I wanted to just do a, you know, not a very long video uh, regarding uh, cannabis and the Ayurvedic approaches to cannabis. So it's, um, I titled it Beyond Ganza because Ganza is uh, very well known and, um, and I think, you know, we need to know that there are other things we can do with cannabis. There are other ways to use cannabis, um, which are healthier and have been along for a really long time. So, um, some objectives should be, one is Ayurvedic medicine. What is it? Uh, where did it come from? What does it mean? What does that mean in, in, well, how is it relevant to cannabis itself? Um, and the second objective is there are many uses of the cannabis plant itself. And so we should delve into this and look at it. And third is that this talk is really should be, um, a beginning point, right? It should be at the seed, uh, pun intended, um, uh, uh, that is sowed in your mind for further inquiry about where we stand on cannabis. You know, a lot of my patients here in Missouri, they talk to me about wanting to use natural medicine. And what does natural medicine really mean? Um, well, we need to harness all forms of natural medicine, all areas of natural medicine, and really use it to our fullest, as our ancestors did at one time. So about me, um, this is me in Kathmandu swinging on a swing. I'm probably like three and I always have chocolate cake on my mind. Um, uh, I'm Pratista, uh, anglicized Pratista, strong. I'm an osteopath. I'm a DO and that stands for doctorate of Med medicine. And an osteopath is taught that nature is to be trusted to the end. And that was uh, Dr. A.T. Still, uh, the founder of osteopathic medicine here in Missouri, the United States of America. And I really do um, harness osteopathic medicine and um, osteopathic medicine was founded in 1892 in Kirksville, Missouri specifically. And in my practice, I combine Western medicine, you know, I have the Western education and the Eastern um, side of Ayurveda, Ayurveda uh, or Ayurved. And that really leads to a creativity in medicine um, about talking to the patient, getting back to a relationship driven practice and stopping assembly line medicine. So I won't get into too much of my practice, but I'm, I'm here in practice in near St. Louis, Missouri, in Kirkwood, Missouri. Primary care, it's private, personalized, concierge medicine. Uh, I do cannabis certifications, and I practice in an integrative and functional and holistic approach. So anyways, segue into traffic. This is circa uh, 2005, even though it looks like it's from 1995 taken from my Lomo in Kathmandu, uh, wherever you are, if you think traffic is bad. Kathmandu's traffic is, I think, worse now in 2021. Ayurveda, or Ayurveda in the anglicized way, um, stands for two words in Sanskrit, Ayur, which is life and longevity. Ved, actually, uh, it's not Veda, but it's Ved. Ved is knowledge in Sanskrit. And this is a 5,000 year um, plus worth of tradition, oral tradition with specialties. I mean, Ayurveda had general medicine, pediatric, surgical medicine, um, ear, nose, and throat. Um, um, they also had a speciali specialty for toxicology. Uh, they also had a specialty for possession of spirits, or uh, we uh, could now think of those whose mind were affected. And at the time, I think that uh, is um, the um, start of psychiatry. They also had a specialty in Rasayana Tantra, which is rejuvenation and longevity for intel intellect and strength. Um, and then another one called uh, Vij Vijaykarna Tantra, which is aphrodisiac or sexual pleasure. So Ayurveda is not just like a, you know, a one-off 
um, accidental medicine, um, you know, created for a few years by uh, very um, inferior peoples. It was a very, very, in you know, specialized um, practice of medicine. And um, we can kind of move on to Eastern versus Western medicine. And Western medicine, we call the osteopathic medicine, uh, allopathic, I'm sorry, medicine. And Eastern medicine, we can call that Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, osteopathic medicine. We can kind of do a comparison um, of those two types of medicine and kind of do like a list of charts. Um, so Western medicine usually looks at disease and treats it. Right? Uh, tooth infection, here's some antibiotics, you know, it should be killed, good to go. Uh, Ayurveda or even osteopathic medicine looks at root cause. So what happened with your tooth? Was there poor dental care? Were you, uh, you know, so anxious and depressed that you didn't have dental care? And why were you anxious and depressed? What is going on in your life? What has that led to? How is your diet? So that's kind of a basic uh, comparison. Recurrence of disease is common in Western or allopathic medicine because um, it's not looked at what the uh, root cause is, right? I would then osteopathic medicine is useful for prevention, meaning that um, if you get to the root, then you can actually prevent it. Western medicine, we hear this a lot, is evidence-based and um, you know, an example, an example is of, um, you know, extracting a specific uh, chemical component from a plant. Um, turmeric is what I think of, and that active ingredient is curcumin, and there have been studies on curcumin and its inflammatory, anti-inflammatory roles, and, um, you know, then we can go through and do placebo and uh, control trials and say, well, is there any benefit or is there any harm? And then you can say there is evidence. That's evidence-based medicine. And, you know, um, that's an example. Oops. So I need to go here. Oh, uh, Ayurvedic medicine is time-tested. 5,000 years of time-tested with people and animals. Um, that um, Ayurveda says, you know, curcumin may be great, but turmeric is the root that comes. And turmeric, there is a synergy of the plant. There's so many other components that we don't know, um, and it can be holistic. Uh, and you lo lose its synergistic effect if you just use curcumin. And so that's an example of uh, evidence-based versus time-tested. Uh, Western medicine focuses on use of plants extracting, I gave that example, and the synergy uh, of the plant itself, meaning that, you know, if we look at the whole plant itself, there's so many other benefits um, to that example of turmeric that we don't even know, right? Here's some cows on the road. That's a highway, actually. It's not a road. And that's very common in Nepal. Um, so... Cultural competence in cannabis. So I want to kind of switch gears and talk about my own cultural competence um, in cannabis, my own exposure, right? My own world worldview of cannabis. And um, it starts with, I guess, the, you know, diary uh, that I had, and I had a, a dried leaf, a cannabis leaf in there. My mom found it and freaked out, you know. But this was when I was actually going to school in, in Kathmandu and we got, we'd walk to our bus stops and there are cannabis plants all over, you know, growing tall ones, taller than me. And I'm only five, three. And so that was one experience. Oh, the second is, you know, my grandmother would tell me stories about how she would pick, pick wild seeds, uh, near a fallow area and their in their, um, in their like kind of uh, home, nearby their home. And her great grandfather would tell her to go pick some seeds today and we're gonna eat those because my knee hurts. 
So that's an interesting anecdote. Uh, a family friend of ours was sick at the age of four, and his grandfather was an actual physician in Ayurvedic medicine, and that's called a boide. And his grandfather gave him instructions on taking specific parts of the cannabis plant and, and using um, certain nuts, almonds and cashews, and certain spices, um, cardamom and um, cinnamon, and making uh, an edible out of it. And he, I think he had talked about having liver issues when he was four, and he used this for multiple weeks, three, four weeks when he was at the age of four and got over whatever liver infection he had. I had a cousin that had um, had uh, knee pain and my cousin's uh, grandmother had uh, growing cannabis growing in, in the backyard and they would go pick some and place the leaves on the knee. And so, you know, multi-generational use of um, cannabis in Nepal. Um, and we can't, you know, forget about Shivaratri. But uh, before I digress into Shivaratri, this actual illustration that I have here is from um, the Materia Medica. It's a, a German source. And uh, just wanted to kind of state that um, there was a Greek physician who was a Ro in the Roman army that traveled widely in campaigns through Rome and studied many plants and gathered knowledge into a book called that he called the De Materia Medica on medical matters. And this was published in about um, um, ADE 70 um, uh, or ACE, Common Era, I think Common Era, I'm sorry, Common Era of 70. And it became most the most important medical text of that time for the next 1500 years. And that's where that particular image comes from. And cannabis was definitely included in there. Um, both cannabis emeris and cannabis agria, male and females, were studied by this physician, Discorides. And he it stated bluntly that the plant was used in making the rope and also produced a juice that was used to treat earaches and suppress sexual longing. But anyways, just wanted to throw that in there. Shivaratri, let's talk about Shivaratri. Shivaratri, uh, let's digress a little bit to Shivaratri and look at Shiva. Shiva translates uh, to the night, it translates, Shivaratri translates to the night of Shiva. Shiva is um, a, um, it's basically his birthday. Shiva, there he is, um, so of sound mind. Uh, he is a protector, the creator. He's a transformer. And during the night of Shivaratri, you know, it's a great uh, celebration. Um, people are told to fast, to meditate, to forgive, to not injure others. And this is happens around the spring equinox. It is the time when winter is done and so you can think of that destruction transformation protection during this time form and the story is that when he's meditating in the himalaya like you see all the mountains he's up there in the himal um he is a great aesthetic and he's obtaining from all forms of indul indulgence and pleasure and he's focusing rather rather on meditation and means of finding uh, bliss and happiness and he is a protector of the Vedas and a patron of yogis and Brahmins. And he comes down, when he comes down to earth, he tends to indulge and destroy. And um, there is, for celebration of that time for his birthday when he comes down, the Nepali government uh, gives what's called bhang at the spring equinox. It happens every year. Bhang is given. And uh, we'll talk about what bhang means in a little bit. But it's a, cons it's a drink. And this was consumed um, by everybody, and it's given out. And the consumption of, of this drink was to deliver the consumer to spiritual enlightenment by peeling back the layers of consciousness and revealing one's true nature. So Shivaratri is another example of cultural confidence uh, in, in, in the East, of how we 
have seen cannabis for years, thousands of years. So this is not new to us. And here is the yogi, right? Or yogi. And a yogi isn't, by the way, somebody that does yoga. A yogi or yogi is an aesthetic. He renounces uh, physical and worldly pleasures. And he um, also, is, it's known, to, he consumes uh, cannabis. So let's talk about a little bit of history. Uh, because I'm kind of all over the place, right? We're talking about Ayurveda. We're talking about, um, you know, all these little anecdotes through time from me, from my experiences. But let's talk about a little bit of history to kind of fill you in on some history. Sometimes um, Western practitioners tend to forget. So here is a photo, I think, from the 70s. Um, I may be wrong, but I think it's early 70s. Of you see the Inn Eden Hotel Hashish Gaja Sap on the first floor. Uh, it's a Hashish uh, Eden Hashish Center. This was a real store, a real shop in Kathmandu, and this was in Freak Street, what was dubbed Freak Street. And in the 60s, with the Cultural Revolution, the hippies influxed over to Nepal, um, renouncing, you know, um, Vietnam War and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they wanted an alternative lifestyle. And so they flocked to Kathmandu, a specific area of Kathmandu, and they, which they ended up dubbing Freak Street. And because of the influx of the hippies from the United States, young people, young able-bodied people that could potentially go to war, but they were actually renouncing it. Um, 1973, Nixon and his recently formed DEA, the Drug um, Enforcement Agency, um, paid the king uh, to ban the king of Nepal uh, to ban uh, cannabis um, and it was 50 to 70 million dollars uh, of a payment so the United, United States government you know paid the country to just completely outright ban cannabis something that I just told you right we were using for thousands of years and it was in our cultural heritage 1976 was the Narcotics Drug Act, Drug Control Act. Uh, it actually banned the sale, the cultivation, the use of cannabis, and you know the rest is history. So it was only in uh, on the 29th of June in 1987 that the Nepal signed uh, on a related UN convention, um, a single convention on narcotic drugs. Um, so they kind of banned it themselves. So Nepal actually banned a very useful medicinal um, plant. And again, like I said, the rest is history, right? We all know about all the, the, the bans in the United States and the rest of the world. So it set a precedence, you know, in the 70s, it set a precedence when you are using something that has been going on for thousands, 5,000 years, and then all of a sudden it's an abrupt halt. It's very sad. Very sad. Um, and so... Let's talk about cultural practice, right? And that's the whole point of this. We're, 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 we're getting um, re-education because we are getting a green movement in the world. It's happening not only in the United States, but it's happening in Europe. Um, but it is sort of sad that certain groups of people are okay to start again, which is unfortunate. But still it's happening. You know, it's still happening, and um, it, it's unfortunate that these countries, like my own country of Nepal, lag in legality because of, you know, 30, 40 years of practice that was imposed on by other, other governments. But everybody knows because of the illicit market, because of that ban, because of the consequences, unintended consequences of the Narcotic Drug Control Act, um, everyone knows about cannabis, marijuana, right? And even in Nepal, it's called marijuana, but it's funny that it wasn't before the ban. Um, everyone knows the most famous form of cannabis, that form, right? What is this? This is, oh, there's the bud. Oh my gosh, there's so many. That's so beautiful. Everyone knows the band because, because of that um, illicit market. So essentially making it illicit had made 
um, people think, well, let's just get the most bang for our buck and we'll just get the flower and that has the most potency and we'll use that. So everyone knows the flower bud. But my point of this whole lecture, right, is that um, Ayurvedic medicine, what is it, and the uses, uh, and that cannabis has more forms than you know. Um, there are more, many more forms of cannabis. It is not just the bud. Um, so let's talk about the four forms. There's number one, dana. It's not dana, it's dana. Uh, number two is bhang. And number three is ganza. And number four is tzoros. And we'll talk about all four forms, the traditional forms of cannabis in Ayurvedic medicine. Number one, dana. So dana is seed. And there are the seeds. Um, it is a great source of food. And if you notice here, you have the husk of the, the, the um, I think this one particular picture is of hemp seeds, but they can be of, of cannabis seeds as well. But there is outer husk. And in the United States of America, you can get hemp hearts which is essentially they take this husk out and they throw it away and, and well, A is so that people don't grow it, honestly. Um, that's the main reason, I think. That's my theory. And so people really don't know the whole seed and what it looks like. They think it looks like that kind of softer inner portion of it. But it is a great source of food. Um, it has protein. It has unsaturated fats. It has fiber um, inside there of the of of the of the hemp heart it's or the or of the hold you know there is omega threes um and so it's it's a very interesting source of food so the protein portion of it contains as much as a soybean and in every 30 grams of seeds is about three tablespoons there's nine grams of protein Unsaturated fats. Here, let me back up here. I went too fast. There are uh, those reduce inflammation. They lower blood pressure, and there's so many health benefits of polyunsaturated fats, specifically omega-3 fatty acids, that are well known and well studied. Hemp seeds, cannabis seeds are um, a great source of this, and also a great source of alpha linoleic acid. Much of the fiber of the hemp seed is on that outer hull or that shell that I was talking about. And um, it is possible, if, if possible, you know, a lot of people, if they're cultivating and they have a whole surplus of seeds, keep those holes intact. Um, however, uh, without the shells, they're a good source of fiber too. Um, and consuming enough fiber can reduce appetite help the weight will help with weight management uh, work to stabilize blood sugar promote the health of the gut and there's also um, vitamins and minerals the hemp seed itself contains all an impressive array of vitamins and minerals especially rich in vitamin E magnesium and phosphorus and potassium and there's a whole bunch of B vitamins iron zinc um, B vitamins like niacin, riboflavin, thiamine, B6, and folate. So let's talk about a little uh, more about how these seeds are uh, helpful for the health. Um, hemp and cannabis seeds, when you eat them, and this is when you actually eat them, um, have benefits seen in protecting the brain. There uh, was a recent review from 2018 that suggested that CBD and other compounds in the seeds have a neuroprotective, anti-inflammatory effects and uh, effects to help regulate the immune system. And the seeds itself contain cannabidiol. Um, and so extracting those holes is actually a detriment. So eating them whole is better. It also boosts heart health. So those omega-3 fatty acids improve heart health. They also... Um, um, contain high levels of arginine in the seed. That is an amino acid that turns into nitric oxide. So nitric oxide itself is essential in artery and vein dil dilatation, which causes uh, blood vessel walls to, uh, um, blood vessels, walls, uh, the smooth and, and elastic uh, walls to um, dilate, de therefore decreasing blood pressure. It improves skin conditions like uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, which is also known as eczema, and acne by um, reducing chronic inflammation. 
and um, and that may be due to the uh, deficiencies in omega threes that people have with acne, and it also increase um, reduces oh, reduces inflammation, and the amount of omega threes with the hemp seeds and cannabis seeds uh, have that omega higher omega three to omega six ratio that help to re reduce inflammation, and it, I think I meant to say a higher omega-6, lower omega-3s. In addition, um, hemp seeds are rich in a source of gamma-linoleic acid, which is has anti-inflammatory benefits. So how do you eat the cannabis seeds? Uh, well, how do we eat it? Well, we in Nepal, we eat it by roasting it. You use clarified butter, and you get the seeds, you roast it, a dry roast or butter, clarified butter roast, and clarified butter is ghee, by the way. And you roast them up, put some salt after they're nice and toasted, and salt and some chopped up ginger and garlic and cumin and coriander leaves and squirt some lemon on there. And you've got great bhang seeds that you can eat um, right then and there. Um, and that's the upgrade of the extra ingredients. You can do them plain or you can do the upgrade that I just told you about. And uh, I've heard... Uh, through Ay Ayurvedic talks, that pang seeds, when roasted with ghee uh, and taken and eaten by men, help with impotence, actually help with erectile dysfunction, uh, which makes sense because of all that nitric oxide and uh, blood flow, right? So that was the dana, or the seed. Very beneficial. Second is bhang. So I've already made a reference to bhang, but let's specifically talk about bhang in which we talk about the leaves of the males and the female plants. Because bhang, we talked about with shivaratri and the drink, there's kind of two names for the same, two different things, same name, two different things. Um, so in certain parts of India and Nepal, um, it's it, it also is named for the use of the flowers of the male plants. Yes, male plants also have, male flowers um, also have uses. And um, for our case, we'll call it all, we'll call it um, um, leaves. And there are, there are forms of raw, there are forms of dried and crushed, and there are forms of the decarboxylated or the heated. Um, and there's different administrations of these, both in or uh, all four four places of oral, topical, inhaled, and rectal. And that's you know you guys should be familiar with that. Um, so bhang refers to the leaves. We'll just kind of talk about the leaves specifically. And there are different conditions that use different types of bhang. So here's some examples, right? Dried leaf powder is applied on fresh wounds to promote healing and granulation tissue can actually form from that. Uh, fresh leaves can be used and juiced as a diuretic, treating inflammations of the bladder and kidney stones, so they go right into the bladder and kidney and, um, and help with stones. You can crush fresh leaves with mustard or sesame oil. So mustard oil or sesame oil is very common in Ayurvedic medicine for um, healing. Um, medicinal, uh, the medicinal effects, both of the antibacterial, antifungal, um, and healing of the skin. So that can be, uh, a fresh poultice can be crushed with these, these types of oils, um, and put on different types of skin infections, on rashes, neuralgia, erysipelas, which is a bacterial infection, zoster, which is viral, chickenpox is a viral, eczema, which is an inflammatory condition, to diminish pain and itching. Um, and... To clarify, bhang as a drink, uh, bhang leaves are taken and actually boiled into a milk and yogurt drink that is absolutely delicious. Not just milk and yogurt, but it's it has nuts, it has almonds, it has pistachios, it has um, cardamom, it has um, a saffron if you get fancy, and it's made into... Um, a drink, a, a very delicious drink, probably has some sugar in there too, to make it tasty. But um, that is bhang as a drink, and that is what's drunk at uh, Shivaratri or the Spring Equinox. So I just wanted to clarify that. Number three on our list is gaza. So gaza is referred to as the female plant or the flowers of the female plant itself. 
okay? And I'm not going to go very far into this because everyone knows Gaza. The whole world knows Gaza. Um, you know, call it what you will. You've got your whole list of stuff. Um, and that is uh, within all the forms of, for the most part, because of the illicit market, we know that it can be um, inhaled. Um, so, and there's a lot of different ways in extracting this. But back in the day, it was just dried and um, and smoked, either in a tillon or something similar, like a clay pipe. And so this is a really potent form, but we've got one more, which is Taras. And this is the most powerful of the Ayurvedic forms, um, and the most powerful narcotic. And it's actually a plant resin from live plants. So it's the resin that comes from a live plant when it's alive. Leaf stems, fruits of the plant, everything. And just wanted to clarify that hashish, which is the uh, resin or uh, concentration, is of a dead plant. And that's a, a more traditional definition. And it's really, if you think about why these came about, uh, a cannabis plant is, um, you know, it makes its vegetative material, it has, it flowers in the summertime or in tropical areas, and then it seeds, and then it lays dormant for the winter where it's colder. So this is a form, a storage form of the plant for the winter because you're not traditionally, right? 3,000 years ago, we didn't have greenhouses where there are auto flowering plants and you could just snip them off and you can start a new run every, you know, so many months. So traditionally, we didn't have that luxury. And so this is a, st a traditional storage for winter, uh, for wintering the plants. And so this is very interesting. It naturally comes off the hand um, and one has to slowly collect it um, and it takes a lot of patience and awareness of what you're collecting to know what you're doing. Dados is, again, a very potent narcotic. It is the plant's resin, and it's been used in Ayurveda to um, arouse psychiatric states and manic states, sometimes for the short-term use for chronic insomnia, but also for chronic pain in terminal phases of TB and malignant tumors. And back in the day, there was a lot of TB and malignant tumors before, um, before the advent of um, antibiotics and stuff. So it's also administered in cases of chronic debilitating cough, dry cough, like pertussis and lung cancer. And um, Ayurvedic doctors preferred cannabis over opium because as, um, uh, as cannabis does not produce nausea and loss of appetite and const constipation and headaches like opium did at the time. So at the time they were using um, these for serious conditions, Stodos are the, the concentrates basically for serious conditions, serious medical conditions. And here I wanted to show you some pictures of um, a gentleman getting a plant that's rooted in the ground. He's rubbing it and they people will do this. Um, they go from plant to plant to plant to plant daily and they end up with this resin and then they uh, ball it up and then they collect it and that is a two um, paisa or cents, two cents equivalent um, so it's like a penny size of concentrate that is stored very easily um, and you just kind of get this once it's at room temperature uh, I'm sorry, body temperature in your hand it just kind of rolls up very easily and, and hardens so those are the those are the forms, uh, traditional forms, and I hope that that is very enlightening for you all to see. And like I said, my third objective was to give an intro and plant the seeds for cannabis in traditional forms uh, for the future. And here's me, 2005, acting my usual self in Kathmandu. So. Namaste to you all.